Why is everything so difficult? And does it have to be? If we know what matters most, but it's too difficult to do or too hard to find the time, where does that leave us? This is the 5 a.m. Miracle, episode number 392. Effortless. Make it easier to do what matters most with Greg McEwen. Good morning, I am Jeff Sanders, and this is the podcast dedicated to dominating your day before breakfast. Now, I discussed Greg McEwen on this podcast before many times, actually. I have quoted him from his previous book, Essentialism, and I usually cite the quote, if it's not a clear yes, it's a clear no. Honestly, I kind of view Greg as a legend in the productivity space, and it's really cool to have him on the show this week. Now, Greg has dedicated his career to discovering why some people and teams break through to the next level and others don't. The best example of this is addressed in his New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestseller, Essentialism, The Disciplined Pursuit of Less. Essentialism challenges core assumptions about achievements to get to the essence of what really drives success. He is also the host of the What's Essential podcast and author of his latest book, Effortless, which is the topic of today's conversation. Jeff, it's great to be with you. Thank you. So I actually want to begin today's discussion uh, going a little bit backwards to your previous book, Essentialism, because that's a book that I have quoted on this podcast a few times uh, in the past. And I know our audience is familiar with it, but I want to hear kind of from your take uh, what that book was about and how that's led to your latest book uh, with Effortless. Essentialism is about figuring out what is essential, eliminating everything that's not as much as possible, uh, and then also making execution as easy as possible. That's like the structure of essentialism. It grows out of the idea that only a few things are essential and most stuff is not. There's a vital few things, but so much trivial stuff that um, that keeps us from doing the things that matter most. Um, It grew out of work that I was doing with companies and noticing that Um, that when they fell into the undisciplined pursuit of more, uh, they would start to plateau in their progress or even fail altogether. Uh, But then while I was observing that, I noticed that it happens at the personal level too uh, and was happening in my life. Uh, I got an email from from a colleague at the time that said Friday between one and two would be a very bad time for your wife to have a baby. Um, (laughs) And uh, sure enough, our daughter was born Um, in the early hours of a Friday morning. And so I'm there in the hospital, uh, you know, instead of being focused on that clearly supremely important moment, uh, I've got my laptop out, my phone out, I'm feeling torn, I'm feeling fragmented. And to my shame, I go to the meeting. And afterwards, even afterwards, the colleague said, well, look, the client will respect you for the choice you just made. And the look on their faces didn't evince that sort of respect. But even if they had, it's clear I made a fool's bargain, that I violated something essential for something non-essential. And what I learned was if you don't prioritize your life, someone else will. And essentialism really grew out of that as I understood and wanted to understand why it is that we prioritize the way that we do. So if you had to summarize essentialism in one word, it would be prioritization uh, and uh, and. The new book, if you had to summarize effortless in one word, it's simplification. Because what I've learned in the years since writing Essentialism and working with people all over the world now on this is that for a lot of people, they do know what's essential, but it's just too hard to make it happen. Or at least they think it's going to be too hard. Or the way they're approaching it makes it too hard. And uh, in this new book, what I'm really trying to explore and to teach is how to make the most essential things the easiest things so that we can do them and do them consistently. Yeah, that's a great breakdown. I want to dig into the, the latest book, uh, Effortless, Making It Easier to Do What Matters Most. I guess let's begin with the simple question of why are things so hard? Well, life is hard. Um, it's hard in a hundred ways. Um, and The complication is that we make it harder than it needs to be. When we do that, uh, the implication is that we'll burn out and still not have achieved the results that matter most. And so my position uh, in this new book is that we can make a different choice, that we um, can 
search for and find an easier path. And if we do that, then we can break through to the next level of results, but without burning out. So that's the context. Um, in terms of why we make it harder than we need to, I think it's because we have a mental model for a variety of reasons, partially because of Puritan roots, um, partially just because of hustle culture in a, in a modern world of, 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 after the Industrial Revolution. All of these things fit together to create an idea that the only way to achieve things is through effort. Right? There's some truth to that. But then it gets pushed beyond that place of truth into a place of untruth, which says, therefore, the only way to break through to the next level is to put exceedingly great effort and so on. And so we get to the point where we not only, we not only celebrate work and, 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 and doing good work and putting in some effort, we start to say, if I'm not exhausted, I must not be doing enough. If I'm not working 24-7, I must not be doing enough. And then even beyond that, to distrust the easy so that we, we, aren't, we avoid it sometimes, uh, repelled by it, even when there actually is a less, maybe it's less sophisticated sounding, or maybe it doesn't sound as heroic or impressive, but it's actually a simpler, easier path. And that really matters to be able to embrace that. So I'm not advocating that we suddenly become lazy and everything. Um, but I am advocating that there is this third alternative, a sort of moral, um, good, but easier path. And today in the world, I think it has the power of relevancy because there's so many people uh, who are engaged, driven, but also on the edge, teetering right on the edge of exhaustion or burnout. Do you think that a lot of the issues that people are struggling with in terms of the, the level of difficulty could stem from just pure distraction? Because I know from my experience when there are you know important things to get done and I feel like it's difficult to make that move, it's often because either A, there's too much on my plate or B, it's because I feel like there's just so many other like avenues to go down, so many different distractions to kind of you know let myself be pulled away to. Is that how, how does distraction kind of play into this idea of making things easier to just accomplish in general? People are dealing with a false dichotomy. On the one hand, uh, they believe and maybe have set their lives up in such a way that the essential things are the hardest things. Um, a lot of people believe it, don't even question it, don't even know they think it. Um, I, I've, I've heard leaders just state it. Um, no one questions it. Nobody doesn't raise, raise any eyebrows. This thing is so important. It's going to be so hard, but it's going to be worth it. Nobody even questions it. It's just assumed. And then on the other hand, you have things that are trivial and easy. And so, and, and often they're easy because somebody has intentionally made them easy. So you think of, um, think of the, these things that you're saying will be distracting um, social media is, is often named when I say, well, what's non-essential that you're over-investing in? And that's, that's, that's one of several very regular answers I hear. And we'll just think of how much work has gone into making that effortless. And that's not by default. Uh, companies and some of the companies that I've worked with closely have spent combined, I'm sure now, trillions of dollars now, but certainly hundreds of billions. Literally, that's not an exaggeration. That's literally true. To design the network, the system, the um, sometimes addictive uh, processes inside of the companies and the actual tools that you're using on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and so on. And, and, then, and then all the, the, the hardware that, you're, that has been designed by the very various manufacturers to put it in your hand. And, I mean, all of that has been designed to make it effortless. So, yeah, now you've got in people's minds, those are their options. Hard, essential work versus easy but trivial work. And, of course, if you only have those two options and you happen to be hardwired, as we are biologically, to search out for the path of least resistance, you're going to find yourself in that second category a lot of the time. And so one response to that would be to say, well, no, 
you know, knuckle down, get to it, get serious, put more in. You need to be, you know, disciplined from the inside. That's what you need more of. And, and that's fine, but it's a really limited supply. There's only so much of that. An alternative, and that's, again, what I'm advocating is, what if you could construct it where you stack the decks in your favor, where doing the most important thing doesn't feel overwhelming? What if it, what if it could be effortless? I mean, what if we just even ask that question? We just give our brain a better option. What if this could be easier? What's the easy way to do this? How could we do the essential thing, but in a way that we enjoy doing it? How could it be enjoyable? How could we reduce the friction to making it happen? And in this different, you know, asking these different questions produces different answers and you can start to construct solutions that previously weren't even contemplated. And so that's the work, you know, that's the work that needs to be done. Uh, and, and once you do it, it means that you can start to, uh, you can start to reap the benefits. Let me give you a specific example. Um, a lot of people think of the essentials as a chore. And that's why we don't want to do it. Uh, and then, then, of course, there's work on habits. And there's lots of great work on habits that's worth reading. And, um, and some of that I cover in Effortless. But there's a third category that gets a lot less attention. And it's rituals. So what's the difference between habits and rituals? Because often people use those terms interchangeably, but they're not the same thing. Habits are what you do, but a ritual is how you do it. Sometimes people will say, okay, I, I, I need to exercise. I've taken up running. I do it now. You know, I'm doing it regularly. I say, do you like running? Oh, I hate running. Okay, so you've taken a chore and you've turned it into a habit. Now that's easier. It's easier to have a habit doing something you don't like to do than to just not have the habit. I get that because you've taken off some of the cognitive strain uh, that, that, that equals effort. You don't have to think about it as much. You just are going to do this thing. But what if we could come up with something that the thing itself is enjoyable? Or something you look forward to doing in and of itself. So you combine the essential with something enjoyable. Something maybe enjoyable that you like to do already. Um, thinking of a CEO friend of mine who was, um, you know, wanted to be running every day. And he, he, he combined it with listening to a favorite podcast. He only gets to listen to that podcast when he's on the treadmill. So he's made it more enjoyable. For me in my life, I want to exercise consistently. What's an enjoyable way to do that? Well, for me, I love swimming. Uh, if I could do it with my children and make it into something that we do together, um, then, then that makes the experience something rich, not just the advantage afterwards. And so that's what we do now. We'll go and swim together in the morning. Um, and, and that, that experience doesn't feel like work. I don't dread doing it. I don't have to white knuckle my way into performance. We want to do it. We, we laugh while we're going down there. We enjoy the experience. It's like I almost want pictures of every day because it's just like delightful. I can swim under the blue sky. I mean, it's like the experience is rich. The experience is, is compared to the chore of the exercise can be. It is far easier. And, and, and even I think, you know, I wouldn't even just say effortless. It's like enjoyable. As that's an example of how like you can start to construct a life where the essential things happen, even if you don't really, you know, feel hyper motivated or feel like particularly driven to do it today uh, because they happen naturally. Yeah, that's a great point. I know one of the ways that I fell in love with running was to make it an enjoyable activity. So I love to be in nature. So I do trail running and that's really fun for me. I really look forward to doing it. It's not this obstacle I have to overcome. And I mean, to that degree, I'm thinking about like work that I, I don't really necessarily want to do that. I don't have that level of enjoyment with. 
is part of this just relying on our strengths because I know that when I do things I'm good at, it's definitely more fun. Is is part of this kind of transformation of making things easier, spending more time like in your strength zone, or is that like I guess another method to make this an effortless task? Yes, it's another example of it. It's not one I go deeply into in effortless, but it's certainly a strategy that works. I I myself uh, was at law school for. Uh, almost a year in the UK, not enjoying any of it. Everything was drudgery about that. Everything was hard about it. I didn't want to do it. Uh, what I wanted to do was teach and write uh, in the field of leadership and and human performance and human potential. And like that's what I wanted to do. And so I would spend most of my day doing that, just in a very informal way, uh, reading books, learning, studying it, studying those that were doing it. And then I would spend all these hours doing, trying to study law into the night because, okay, you have to do that. And it took until I was uh, visiting friends in the United States where somebody said, oh, if you do decide to stay in America, then you should join this consultation committee. And I never did join that committee, but their sense of you could do something different changed the direction and, and in the end trajectory of my life because I left their office and said, well, what would you do if you could do anything you know, what if your life could be constructed around the things you actually feel a sense of mission, uh, even, you know, capability, competence. And I, I made a list of everything you would do if you could do anything. And I noticed law school wasn't on the list. And so that was effectively the end of law school. And I just think about it quite regularly that if I'd taken the path I was on, I just wouldn't have been good at it because all of it would have been, you know, if, if, you, if your work life feels like chewing glass, then how much of it are you going to do and how good are you going to be at doing it? Uh, in, in the end, it has been, in comparison, a joy. I just don't think I would have been very good at m- most other things. But this thing, I, I think about when I don't have to think about anything. I think about it because I want to think about it. I certainly think that when you can construct your career around your highest point of contribution, uh, you know, a sense of what you came here to do, then the road starts to feel easier because it doesn't mean everything will be easy, but it does mean you aren't fighting against certain things that are making it even harder, fighting against your own capability, your own interests, your own passions, uh, you know, it's hard enough without also being at odds with all of those important forces. I mean, the concept of fighting is an interesting one because I have thought of this in a similar way in terms of when I find myself kind of fighting or find myself stressed out or find myself in a situation where it appears that what I'm doing is just struggling much more than I think is necessary. Like, are those the signs that we are like have an opportunity to simplify or eliminate something? Or is that kind of part of what it means to get to a place where things are easier? Like, is there a necessary fight or is a fight kind of a a red flag that something's wrong? My wife, Anna had a mentor who once just said, don't force anything. Hmm. And that has become a great mantra for us. When we feel like we're forcing something, let's just, let's just pause. It, it, life shouldn't be a forced experience. If you're forcing a relationship, stop. <laughs> if you're forcing a career path, if you're forcing, in my case, a book project, stop. Immediately after Essentialism was written, Um, I felt um, obliged uh, and even somewhat motivated to just write another book. But there was another part of me, a deeper, wiser part, that just said, it's not time. You just got to wait. I remember for a few days, maybe even as much as a couple of weeks, I tried to push that aside and just force forward. You know, this, I'm just going to do it. And I was forcing it. And I could feel that forcing sensation in me. And finally, I just, I gave way to it. I said, no, that's just, this doesn't feel right. It feels too forced. And so I stopped and I, I, I didn't pick up writing a book again for years until it suddenly felt right. 
and then it started to flow and it was a much different experience. And, and, and even now, I feel very clear about what I need to be writing next. And it's just, again, a much more flowing experience. Not everything has to be so hard. And if you're in the forcing territory, I think you're better off stopping and looking for a different path that feels more right, you know, and that you can pursue it in a, in, in a, a way that doesn't feel violating of other principles. Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, but this concept of, of being simple, and this is the approach of, of an effortless task, how do we go about approaching a, a complex task or project and making it simple? Like, are there ways that we can kind of approach something that is like, you know, daunting to us and really break it down to make it easier? I think the questions that we ask about essential projects really matter. Um, and that's a theme in this conversation is, is ask, ask better questions. Questions are answers. And so if you ask, what does done look like on this project? Um, I, I, I'm working on a project right now that could be very overwhelming. If I don't define what done looks like, I could work on it for months and months. But if you never define what done looks like, you work on it for years and years. And that question cuts through the clutter. What does done look like? How will I know when I'm done? Well, when I say it that way, it becomes very concrete. For me, it's a, it's a proposal that I'm writing. Um, it done looks like four to five pages that are really strong that I feel good about sending an email. That's it. That's done. If you don't get de- done defined, it could be 20 pages, it could be 30 pages, you could add graphics, I could do all sorts of things to it. I could never get to done. That's the first thing to do. The second question is, what's the very first or next obvious action? Don't worry about the 50th action, the 100th action, the 1,000th. What's the the next one? Doing can only be done in in a a next increment. Literally, the next thing I can do is I can click to that page. It's already open but I can click to it and I can write the next sentence. Like that's the next thing. Okay. Here's one of my favorite hacks that I came across for the book or language editions is a microburst. 10 minutes. What can I do? Actually set a timer for 10 minutes. How much progress can I make in 10 minutes? So I know what the first step is. That's just opening it, clicking it. But if I set a timer for 10 minutes, how much can I get done? Or maybe I can write, there's a paragraph I know I need to write in it that feels right. I could get that paragraph done in the next 10 minutes. That Suddenly, you're, you're, you're making progress. Another thing, do I have courage to be rubbish? Am I willing to just write that paragraph and not expect it to be perfect? No writing's perfect at the beginning. So let the am I willing to write one rubbish paragraph? That's what I can do in 10 minutes. I can write one rubbish paragraph, but then at least I've got a paragraph and it's something I can then work on. Yeah. Maybe one final question with the project I'm illustrating it with is, uh, what are the minimum number of steps to get this done? This is really important. Distinction is... There's two ways to go about simplification, and the masters at it, the people that understood effortless execution, uh, do it one way, and the rest of us do it another way. Okay, let me illustrate this. Um, the, the, there's a, a technician assigned um, a designer at Amazon. This is 20 years ago when Amazon was still... I mean, just online shopping was so new. Um, it was it was quite um, sort of a scary thing for people to do. They weren't so sure. Do I want to put credit card information? Does it feel safe? They weren't familiar with it. it was and this technician was assigned to simplify the checkout process at Amazon. He spent two months on that project, and what he did 
is he tried to simplify every step in the process, which actually seems really reasonable. Like each thing, how can I make each step as smooth as possible? And so what it looked like at the time is you put your name in, okay, click, next page, last name, click, next page, okay, address, click, you know, first, first part of your credit card, click, and so on. There's like 25 pages. And he was having a meeting with the first employee of Amazon um, and with Jeff Bezos and at this brewery, and there's just the three of them talking about this. And he remembers that Jeff just says, no, not like this. Oh, I mean one click. How do we do it in one click? And that is the birth of one click processing that Amazon protected for the next I think, 20 years. Who knows the valuation of that the power of that single moment? Um, so one could argue, well, how can you how can you protect that? That doesn't feel like that feels like too much of an advantage in the marketplace. But here's what the genius was. There's nobody else in all of e-commerce was thinking like that. They were all thinking the way that we think about simplification. Let's take the complex thing and go, you know, simplify each piece of what we have. What he was doing was starting from zero. How do we do it in one step? How, how do we not have the steps at all? And what's interesting, and we could talk about it if it's interesting to you, is that Steve Jobs took the same approach to simplification. He did exactly the same type of work. It wasn't one click, but in other ways where he said, look, how do you do it in one step? I don't want to take complexity and cut it in half. I want to start with nothing, zero, and do it in one step. And so that's that's the same idea, same thing I need to do. I need to be saying, what's how can I do this in one step? How can I get this thing finished, this project I'm talking about, in one step? Uh, the person that's asked me for this project, as I started to spin in it, as I started violating everything I've just talked about, just sent me a text one day and he just said, this is like a week ago, he said, just get it done today. Now, I didn't get it done today, um, but that question, that statement was like a start from zero type mentality. It was like, oh, to get it done today, I'd have to think really differently about this. And so we're about a week on and now we are complete. And I think today or tomorrow I will be complete. And I wouldn't have been if I hadn't had that jolt from him saying, just, just get it done now. Don't do all this extra bells and whistles. You don't need any of that. Just get, let's just get this finished. And, and, and what, what, what's, how was the one step to being done? And all of these questions release the enormous capacity in our brains to solve problems in an um, easier, more effortless, more doable way and remove all this friction and complication that we add, all this perfectionism that burdens us, all this overthinking that keeps us from actually making progress or getting things done. Yeah, I love what you said about this, the question of, do I have the courage to be rubbish? Which I think is, speaks to this idea of trying to be perfect um, and lowering the bar. And the one discussion I have with my wife frequently is, is her tendency to want to do a lot more for a project. And she has said like very like straightforward, if someone else did this, they would do it faster because they're not doing as much. And that is a problem for her because she doesn't want to be the kind of person who just keeps pushing when the job could be done faster. So I guess part of my question here would be, if we are the kind of person who just wants to keep going, how do we get to a place where we are are okay with less, where we're okay to lower the bar, we're okay with turning in something that's not what we used to do? Like, it feels like it's an, I mean, an ego uh, issue or identity issue. Like, how do we make things simpler when we're used to complexity in that sense. In essentialism, I talk about a 90% rule, meaning only say yes to the things that are 90% are important. What I would recommend here is an 80% rule when you come to execution, which is don't go for 100%. Never go for 100%. 
just go for like 80% done. If you are a perfectionist at heart, because <laughs> you'll never reach perfection. The whole point of being a perfectionist, why, why it's a problem is because you can always make something better and better. The problem of being a perfectionist is that that you never reached the ideal in your mind. You can always go further. Nothing's ever actually fully, fully done. It's like a Pixar, I was told by one of the directors there. We just would release a film. We never, in the perfectionist sense, finished it. And so if you can apply an 80% rule, you say, look, this is 80% maybe how I would like it to be you actually find, well, because I already have high standards, this is actually good enough. This is good. Might even be great. <laughs> it might even be great. But here's what's definitely great, is it'll be done. <laughs> and, and to just take off that 20% pressure so that you don't over-design and over-tinker. I mean, the, 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 the high cost of over-tinkering is immense. How many times have we worked on a project, if you tend to be a perfectionist, where you just keep adding and adding, and actually you reach a point not of just diminishing returns, where each additional unit of effort gives a lower return on investment, but you actually get to negative returns, where every uh, every unit of effort is making the thing worse. That's that's what we have to protect against. If somebody tends to be a perfectionist, you, you don't have to worry about poor standards and just producing something that in the end is just terrible. You actually don't have to worry about that anymore. That's not the problem you're going to have. You're going to have the other problem, and so you need to correct it on the other side. And I think setting an 80% rule is one way to do that. Yeah, it certainly is. I think that definitely applies to my life as well. Uh, there is one other conversation that I think you, you brought up this topic earlier with this idea of burnout. And this is something that I have experienced firsthand and discussed here on the show. And it's a topic that definitely affects high achievers in a profound way. And I, I wonder from that perspective of maybe it is from, from lowering the bar and, and doing less, how do we get to a place where we can not only make things easier, but actually, you know, avoid those intensely stressful, you know, time periods and seasons that lead to us burning out? Like, can we live in a way that is more sustainable for us long term? I think that what we want to discover is a type of effortless pace where you build in not just lower bounds for performance. I suppose I mean writing mentality, but, you know, maybe you say, well, never less than a hundred words a day or something. You don't just have a lower bound. You also have a, an upper bound. You say, well, never more than a thousand words a day. Or somebody says, I want to write a journal. And you say, okay, well, never less than one sentence a day, but never more than five sentences. I did that with journaling. And that's, that is literally how I am now 10 years on. And I'm pretty sure I haven't missed a day in 10 years now. Wow. And it's because you don't want to burn out in the beginning. You've got to create a pace. Now, this story has been covered elsewhere, but it's such a brilliant story for pacing. Um, and this is when, I mean, at the time, it was the, the, the great, the moonshot of the era was getting to the South Pole. No one had ever done it. Uh, the Vikings in a thousand years hadn't done it. And no one in the British Empire and all its naval glory had ever done it. No one had ever made it there. And it had captured the imagination of the explorers and adventurers of the time. as two teams that are trying to make it there. There's um, Amundsen, called the last Viking from Norway, and Captain Scott from Great Britain, they put their teams together. They set off on almost exactly the same day in slightly different spots for the same distance. And it's a race for the poles. And they you know, go. 
the first team, Captain Scott's team, would go as hard as they possibly could, as far as they possibly could on the good days when the weather was good. And then when the weather would turn bad, they'd be so worn out from the good day push that there's no way they were going to take on the bad days. So they would just sit in their tent and complain. You have journal entries from him. He bemoan, did anyone ever have worse luck than me in weather? This is so much worse than anyone who's ever attempted this before. He's writing all of this. Actually, the record shows that he had better weather than the team he was comparing himself to uh, who had previously tried to get to the pole. There wasn't really worse weather. It was the approach he was taking. Burn himself out on the good days. Hunker down in the bad days and bemoan it. So it just created this really negative cycle. Meanwhile, Amundsen is also making this journey. He made a decision early on, 15 miles. Good days, bad days, 15 miles. Um, the account, um, it was a terrible weather, like one of the worst day weathers, we made 13 miles. Okay, it's not 15, but you get the idea, it's hardly any difference. But then the plot thickens where Amundsen gets 45 days between him and his team and the South Pole. They are within 45 miles. It's perfect traveling conditions. And if they do one big push, they can make it there in one day. They don't know where their competitor team is. Everything is brought to this moment. What will they do? They can do it with one big push. They'll be there. No. He still does it in three days. He averages on that three days, 15 miles per day. He still does it. Not knowing if they could be, they, this could have been the difference between winning and losing the great competition, the great honor of the moment. Still maintains the pace. His biographer uses a phrase that leapt off the page to me said, they achieved this victory, and this is the phrase, think of this, without particular effort. That, that's unthinkable. That's breathtaking. They're doing one of, on, the pa on paper, in theory, one of the hardest, most grueling physical challenges that could be designed on the whole planet, and they achieved it without particular effort. Now, you've got to take it with a pinch of salt. You've got to say, take it within context. But the difference between the two teams is still amazing. Amundsen's team makes it. They are the victors. Scott's team gets there 30 days later. It's completely demoralized, completely burned out, and so much so that on the way back, they actually all, the entire team dies on the way home. Hmm. They don't make it home because they just take this completely different approach. This 15 miles, 15 miles, 15 miles, having an upper bound, even in the good times, having the upper bound is a huge insight into how people can perform superbly well. What we want is steady and up. Yeah. We want it slow growth, over a long period of time. That is the way to break through from good performance to excellent performance. That's how to break through to the whole next level of results, but without burning out, is to create an effortless pace. I mean, it really sounds like it's a, a, an attempt to make things boring, but yet it really is an attempt to make things actually work, which I think is is pretty, I mean, it's, it's remarkable in that sense that the simplicity of that is right in front of us. But I think our tendency is to want to push, to want to do 45 miles in a day as opposed to 15. I think that's a very good example. And uh, Greg, this has been an incredible conversation. I think our audience is going to get a lot from it. And of course, I want them to get a copy of the book so they can make their lives effortless. Uh, so where can they go to find the book and to learn more from you? I, I think if I was going to encourage people to do one thing, it would just be to sign up subscribe to the What's Essential podcast. We were just having such interesting conversations now. And if certainly if they, if they find this conversation interesting or helpful, 
Um, and, and we're really just doing some great work now on, on applying it, having just everyday people call in and really say, okay, what is it that you're dealing with? And let's see if we can't figure out what's essential, how to make that effortless. And, and you see it time and again that it's possible, it's doable, and people walk away. I think I can do this. I mean, imagine if you could identify the things that really mattered most, and instead of just bemoaning it, you go, I think I can do this, it's doable. And that's really what we're trying to do on that podcast. And so that's what I think that'd be the one thing. They'll learn about everything else from there. Okay, perfect. I'll be sure to have the link to that podcast um, in the show notes for this podcast. But uh, Greg, this has been great. I really appreciate it today. Jeff, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. And of course, that action step this week. Go grab your copy of Greg's latest book, Effortless. Also, be sure to subscribe to Greg's What's Essential podcast. There's a lot you can learn from Greg through his books and podcasts, so be sure to dig in and discover just how much you can improve your own productivity systems. JeffSanders.com slash 392 is the place to go to get the episode notes, including links, transcriptions, and more. That's all I've got for you here on the 5 a.m. Miracle Podcast this week. Until next time, you have the power to change your life. And the fun begins bright and early.